The Unshackled Waves, episode 14. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms and it's our interview show once again for this week. And our guest for today is Andrew Cooper, who is founder and president of Liberty Works, which is a new libertarian lobby group that is uh, based in Brisbane. They're an organisation with a lot of potential and have already been doing some great work. So it's a pleasure to have you on the show today, Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Thanks for the invitation to come on. So I've I've mentioned briefly uh, what Liberty Works is, but I'll let I'll let you uh, uh, go into go into detail in your own words about uh, what Liberty Works is all about. Yeah, we're we're, try, we're trying to uh, bring a more of a an activist um, uh, activist bent to the libertarian movement um, and trying to uh, uh, create a. Uh, a fairly sizable organisation with uh, people uh, involved in, uh, in most of the major capital cities, all the capital cities around Australia, uh, and our uh, our strategy is to uh, is to uh, create, uh, hold events in which we can influence people, bring people along, have a bit of fun. Uh, for example, we had an event up here in Brisbane with a couple of federal senators and a and a federal MP that went very well, sold out, you know, 130 people in the room, and. Uh, and that was good, and everyone had a good time. There's lots of conversations happen, and uh, after those sort of events, and uh, and uh, our intention is to replicate that, uh, and replicate it many, many times. <laughs> uh, so, what would you say the the, the uh, mission and values are of Liberty Works, to be specific? Yeah, yeah. So, um, our values are uh, really around free markets. Um, and not just economic free markets, but the free markets of ideas as well. When people engage in free markets, uh, uh, it's it's voluntary. Uh, people transact uh, voluntarily, uh, creating win-win transactions where both parties uh, get something out of it. Uh, our view is in, in government-controlled economies, uh, uh, which uh, we think Australia is too government-controlled, but in government-controlled authorities, the business model relies on coercing money out of... Uh, out of uh, taxpayers and and handing it over to to others, uh, there are transactions there. For example, you know, welfare is a transaction in which the receiver of the uh, welfare maybe uh, maybe happy to receive it, but certainly most people who give the welfare payment aren't happy to give it. And uh, so, government heavy economies tend to be uh, win lose economies. Um, and we think that not only do win lose economies not work very well, um, they're also morally inferior. Um, they, uh, uh, you know, they, 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 they rely on coercion to operate and uh, we'd much prefer to see uh, government shrunk back down where there's less coercion and more uh, win-win. Uh, we think that'll be good for the economy and good, uh, uh, it's also a, sort of a moral win for, uh, for everyone as well because it brings, it brings more volunteerism into the economy, which is a good thing in our view. Um, our mission is to... Uh, is to, you know, basically create a big database of uh, of uh, people that think this way and energise them to go out and do something. Uh, libertarians tend to be uh, fairly thoughtful, uh, fairly analytical, um, but the thing that they tend to do most, and I say this uh, half jokingly, is that tend to the thing they do most is argue with each other. Yes. <laughs> what, they, <laughs> what they need to do, in our view, is probably argue less with each other and, and maybe look to persuade others. Uh, that uh, may be open to persuasion uh, rather than debating uh, finer points with each other. Yes, I certainly know a lot a lot about that through my many years. Uh, I, my next question is, uh, I guess, to ask you, uh, why is uh, Liberty Works needed? And the reason why I ask that question is because there are other free market and libertarian lobby groups in Australia. So what extra things or unique things can Libby Works offer that's not already covered? Yeah, well, there's a couple of things there. Look, the, the, reason, the reason it's needed is we need more voices. Um, libertarianism in, a, in Australia is still a, 
you know, it's still an embryonic phase. Uh, and even at maturity, it may be our best hope is that, say, 10% of Australians may end up uh, voting or uh, or advocating libertarian positions. But uh, And that, that may be optimistic because we mustn't underestimate the power of, uh, of, uh, of government... Uh, uh, government's ability to uh, entangle people in into its system. Uh, so you know, many people, when asked, uh, uh, tend to uh, feel some sympathy towards libertarian, um, libertarian sort of philosophy. Uh, but at a practical level, uh, their entanglement with either government uh, payments of some description or or uh, entanglement with uh, uh, business support or, uh, you know, free something or other that's given to them by gov government means at a practical level they don't change their behaviour in particular. Now, we just think that we uh, we can add a, a slightly different voice to the marketplace of, of libertarian think tanks that are out there. And I guess our view is not not to do a hell of a lot of thinking. Um, we think the thinking's sort of done. What we want to do is we actually want to be more impactful. We want to actually change people's opinion. Um, now, having said that, we do we are looking to offer. We're already doing this. We've got a number of writers and people that uh, have opinions that um, that uh, 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 may be libertarian, but they may not be. They may be um, um, uh, they may be more uh, economically uh, minded uh, uh, economists, or they you know, or they might be uh, uh, you know. You know People that have a particular interest in, say, uh, drug uh, decriminalisation, that may not be libertarians as such, but we're interested in getting those, uh, getting the thoughts of those people down in writing and getting that onto, say, our website, and then we populate other, um, other uh, publications such as Spectator and Quadrant have taken our articles. I guess we've, so we've got an interest in sort of in in, in getting a, different voices and different opinions out there. And there are a lot of people, and once people do start to find their voice, either through writing or doing other things or getting involved with events, we then find that we can actually then start, not only do they become more confident about uh, discussing their libertarian ideals, but also uh, more effective in persuading others around, around them to, uh, uh, to listen to, uh, to, the, to the philosophy. So you do aim to be a, a full or a pure uh, libertarian group. I mean, uh, obviously the the other groups that uh, that exist in Australia, such as the Institute of Public Affairs, Centre for Independent Studies, even Australian Institute for Progress in uh, in Queensland as well, they tend to uh, just stick to economics and sort of leave some of the more sort of uh, as as they are a bit more uh, controversial ideas with. Is, uh, to do with libertarianism, but at Liberty Works, you're you're not going to be afraid to to tackle some of those uh, some of those other libertarian issues. Um, we're not afraid to uh, to commit to the uh, you know the full libertarian uh, um, sort of suite of ideals. Uh, but I think I think realistically, if we're going to be persuasive, if we're going to if we're going to seek to influence the most number of people as possible. Um, we've got to pick our we've got to pick our battles, and uh, uh, there are some battles, for example, where where people have a closed mind, and a significant proportion of the population have a closed mind. And and uh, I'll take for example uh, gun control. For example, people have made up their mind about gun control. They're not very open to uh, being persuaded on the issue. In fact, uh, last night at the dinner table conversation this issue came up once again as it inevitably, inevitably does whenever someone wants to talk to me about uh, libertarianism or uh, <laughs> you know uh, and, and 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 it's just it's just a closed mindset so discuss all the evidence and all the um, uh, all the data that you like at the end of the day if someone feels strongly about something it doesn't it doesn't really break through so my view is that is that uh, to uh, be persuasive um, uh, we need to find, uh, or we need to pitch our, we need to pitch our our, our principles in a way that uh, can uh, sort of cut cut through the barriers that are uh, inevitably already there, either through their education or perhaps through some sort of life experience. Um, so uh, I wouldn't say that we'll be out there um, advocating some of the libertarian ideals. Uh, we think we'll probably use the thin edge of the wedge approach, where we find something that's easy to push. And uh, we sort of get in the door using that. Uh, and once people are exposed to the philosophy, we're hopeful that uh, 
uh, that eventually, like probably all of us, eventually we uh, we come around and we fully understand what libertarian really means. Yes, and we'll certainly get to um, some of your your current campaigns uh, later in the episode. Uh, my next question, uh, if I'm, this is just sort of a, a curious question, but can you describe the process of setting up an organisation such as Liberty Works? I mean, for us here at The Unshackled, I mean, it's it's been pretty simple. You get web hosting, uh, domain name, and then you're pretty much set to go. But uh, describe some of the challenges of setting up like a, an actual organisation. Well, I mean, we 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 decided to set this up as a as a as a registered not for profit organisation. Um, uh, unfortunately, that involves dealing with uh, government. Yeah, <laughs> um, which, which which is a bit of a. Uh, but anyway, uh, we've made that decision to do that. Uh, we felt that uh, you know, for me, um, it's not it's not really a business. It's uh, it's something that I want to start. I want to get up and running, and and hopefully one day I can let it free, and it'll 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 much like say the IPA does, it'll have a life of its own, and and people it'll have a sufficient size about it that'll uh, it'll be able to. Um, you know, continue on and and hopefully do some good work. Uh, in the startup phase, though, um, you're really relying on the sweat equity of people that are involved. It's not a lot of money. We don't get a lot of donations. Uh, we've got some members, but not enough to be self-sustaining. Uh, so it's you know you're looking at uh, at involving people that have a passion for uh, uh, you know for the objectives of the organisation, but also maybe appreciate the opportunities that the organisation can give them, and in, in terms of uh, maybe exposing their ideas or uh, uh, or involving them in some something that they feel uh, can make some sort of uh, contribution to uh, society, regardless of sort of even how small it is. Um, I hope that makes some sense. I'm not sure I've answered your question there, Tim. Yeah. Also, yeah, obviously, uh, the you'd say probably the the legal uh, requirements. That's probably the uh, uh, that's probably the biggest issue. Well, once you once I, 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 well, of course, once you um, once you've created the uh, the entity, um, the entity needs to do something. So, uh, so basically, then we're into the into the whole setup phase of you know website design and uh, and uh, all the technology issues that go around that. But having said that, you know I've been involved in uh, in technology businesses for uh, twenty years. Um, you know it's just getting easier and easier as every year goes past. So uh, compared to what I've experienced in the past, really the setup from a technology and and platform point of view and you know, hosting, it's, it's much easier than it's ever been. So I, I don't really feel that there are particular barriers. Uh, probably the biggest barrier is making, or probably the biggest issue is is, is uh, getting the involvement of people that, uh, that are uh, culturally aligned, uh, you know, that understand the philosophy, understand where the, where the organisation, you know, the vision of where the organisation will end up. And, uh, and and I guess, you know, having people that are prepared to put in time and effort for, for basically no pay at this stage, um, that's probably a critical success factor. Yep, so that brings me to my, my next question. So obviously we've, we've talked about it, about it a bit, having supporters is the key to uh, the success of any political uh, lobby group. So uh, would you just like to talk about yeah, the, the reception so far from like-minded people and sort of how have you been getting the, the message, message out there about Liberty Works? Yeah, okay, so we... Um... Uh, well, we, we, we're sort of not trying to get the message of Liberty Works out there. I, I'll start again. There's, there's, two, there's a couple of issues that have surprised me. Uh, first of all is that libertarian, the libertarian industry, if you like, is populated by different groups and different, uh, different personalities that sometimes, from a distance, you think, oh, they're all libertarians. They must have seen all eye to eye. Yes. What, surprised me, what surprised me is that there's always a bit of pushback. I think uh, some libertarians see us as a, as a new entrant. Uh, where did they come from? Who are they? And almost sort of like, a, how dare they have an opinion about something or other? Um, uh, and I, I guess that's natural. If I think about that, that's probably natural. Uh, people feel that uh, you know, they may have an established position. Uh, we're not looking to compete with anyone in libertarianism in libertarian world. Uh, we're not trying to push anyone out. We think the more people involved in uh, in spreading the message about you know, free markets and personal liberty, the better. Um, but it has surprised me that there have been there has been some pushback uh, to what we're doing, um, and some 
sort of curiosity about what our plans are and uh, um, so that's uh, that, that's been surprising and probably the second thing that's kind of surprised me is just how many talented people are out there and how many thoughtful people are out there that are actually available and are willing to make a contribution and I mean take yourself you know the unshackled for example you you sort of you know you put I know you put a lot of time and effort in there and you're you're uh, you, you know you're pushing uh, uh, you're pushing your ideas and uh, it takes a lot of effort and it's you know it's a it's a, more than a hobby. It's it's probably a passion of yours, and it, it, we're all the same, I think. Um, I think uh, I think it's it's a good thing. Um, we're not competitors. Uh, um, we're uh, you know we're all uh, got our eye on something a bit, that's a bit bigger than each other's turf. I hope. Yeah, and, and, and certainly, uh, well, obviously, considering that uh, uh, yeah, there's not like like it's certainly not going to make you much money. We're certainly motivated more by the by, by the passion the, than anything, and that's that's what drives us. Uh, what I also wanted to to talk about. So obviously, you're based in in Brisbane. Is that where is there much of a libertarian? Oh, I guess you call libertarian scene up there. Is that sort of where you've sort of focused your campaigns? Yeah, uh, well, we have by virtue of our, you know, where we're based at the moment. Uh, there, there is a little bit of a libertarian scene. I mean, we, we're we seeking not to really, um, we're seeking not really to create a libertarian scene as that. It's more like a freedom scene. It's, a, it's sort of, you know, I want to involve people from, say, the Liberal Party or the Labor Party or, you know, people that, People that may not even have that great interest in politics, or, or people that are just pissed off with politics and, um, and 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 maybe even disenfranchised from politics, to get them and say, look, there is a different way. Uh, it's not, it's you know, it's not, um, it's not something that I want to. I don't want to take over the libertarian scene here. I just want to expand our influence beyond people that are already philosophically aligned. I want to, I want new people to get exposure to. Uh, uh, to the message and the, the purity of the philosophy. Um, so in that sense, you know, I'm not looking to create a libertarian scene. Uh, the event we had a, a week or two ago, um, you know, we had a we had a, uh, uh, a one-nation senator there. We had a liberal federal MP there. And we had uh, Senator Lionhelm from the Liberal Democrats all speaking in the one room. Um, and it was amazing. It was like a uh, uh, the energy in the room was incredible. Um, and much more, uh, uh, much more positive, and uh, uh, you know, much more, a lot more conversation going on between these different groups. And it, and and a funny thing was the the energy was derived from from their dislike of something, dislike of kind of the authoritarian left. You know? so, so there was this bonding that went on between groups that ordinarily you know argue that argue with each other. Uh, so that was that was really positive, and I, we're looking to do more of that sort of stuff. Uh, bring libertarians and and uh, um, and people that wouldn't describe themselves as libertarians, maybe you know, uh, on economics, Liberal Party members or liberal voters, and maybe on social issues, some of the Labor type people, and bring them together and find common ground. Um, and hopefully, I don't know what you call that scene, to be honest. But hopefully, we can foster that scene in Brisbane a little bit more, and then try to replicate that in other in other cities. Uh, it sounds like, uh, fr uh, from what you've been saying, me, uh, saying to me, there there are a few naysayers about the the Liberty Works project, which is which is a bit <laughs> of a shame. I mean, uh, I, I always am of the opinion that there's there's plenty of room for for everyone, and the the more the merrier. Yeah, no, look, I, I, I'd say the initial reaction was was a little bit uh, like that, but I, I got to say that all that's died down. You know, we've spoken to all the groups. Um, and I'd say that once I understand that we're not seeking to, you know, um, impact uh, any of their areas of interest or downplay those that, you know, we're looking at playing in a slightly different sandpit, well, then um, i got to say that it's, it, I, you know, that, that's all died down. So I wouldn't want to overplay that, Tim. Oh, that, that, that's good to hear. Um, so sort of obviously from the uh, members and supporters you've been able to uh, uh, obtain so far, what sort of issues do they raise with you and will that sh uh, is that sort of shaping your strategy? Uh, well, that's, that's an interesting question because um, we do attract people from all sorts of different issues, from single issue type people, um, 
uh, to those that are on board with the philosophy and want to chip in and help out. But I've got to say, for most people, I think there's just this dissatisfaction with government generally. Um, I think there's just this, and you can see it around the globe, and I know this might might be jumping jumping topics here, but I think there's a, there's and to me this is a very positive thing, but there's a there's a there's a underlying dissatisfaction with government, um, how government runs, uh, how government controls things, uh, how government pisses our money up against the wall, um, and, and I think uh, you know I think we're uh, we're someone that you know we want to foster that feeling. Uh, uh, we don't necessarily want to say, you know, want to be yelling at people and telling them that, you know, government must be paired back to just the provision of courts and police. That just scares people, right? But what we want to do is we say, look, you know, if you're, if you're dissatisfied with government, uh, then we have a path in which we can shrink government down and shrink it and shrink it. Um, and, and that's that, that that's libertarianism, and then, and part of it is there's a philosophy there, and then there's the political realities of how you do that. Um, so I'd say most people are joining us, and we've got a couple of hundred financial members, so we're not not a large organisation. We've got a much bigger database of that. But well, that's a pretty good it, start. That's a good start. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, we'd like a couple more zeros after that. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I'd say most of those people are just frustrated. Um, with, with, with government of all persuasions. Yeah, I've often found that oh, with with libertarianism, it's often uh, that it's uh, it's quite easy to find people who who are annoyed with government, and I often think it's the job of libertarians to make sure that they uh, show that the libertarian solution is is what will solve those those problems. Yeah, I, I think I think that's spot on. I mean. Um, I mean, you and I know that the bigger government gets, the, the you know, the worse it really becomes. I mean, there's no such thing as an efficient government. Milton, Milton Friedman described it as sort of a, it's like trying to stop a dog from barking. It's, um, you can give it all the training in the world, but every now and then the dog's going to bark. And you can try and make government all as efficient as possible, but it, but but pretty well it just returns to, to the norm, which is an inefficient, uh, uh, coercive monolith that uh, just finds new ways to spend our money on nothing. So I think um, you know step number one is to find the people that, even if it's in their gut, even if intellectually they don't understand why it's the case, but it's observable. We need to find those people. We need to put a figurative arm around those people, give them a big hug, and say, "Well, look, you know, this is why government continues to do this. This is why you're feeling um, dissatisfied, and here's the path that we need to take uh, to remove this uh, from our lives and also the lives of our children." Yeah, definitely. Um, my next question is, uh, oh, this is probably a, uh, an outsider's question, but Queensland politics for viewing from afar is often seen as it's quite out there. Uh, it's thrown up some controversial characters over the years. And uh, obviously uh, we saw oh, in 2012 the, the Newman coalition government win a wet landslide win, then get thrown out after one term. And of course now we have uh, One Nation making a, making a comeback. So can you give us a, an accurate picture of the state of, of Queensland politics. Oh, Jesus. I'll give you an accurate picture. I'll give you a picture, right? <laughs> I don't know whether it's accurate. Um, Queen, Queensland's funny. Um, uh, you've really got at least two distinct um, geographical areas. You've got South East Queensland, where most people live, um, and then you've got the rest of the state, and it's a bloody big state. Uh, now I was born in central Queensland. You know, I was brought up uh, on, a, on, a, on a farming property. Uh, I hung around uh, uh, a, a proportion of the population that saw southeast Queensland, Sydney, Canberra, and Melbourne as almost being the enemy. You know, so if you're a Queenslander, you view Sydney as Melbourne as having this uh, this cosy little sort of uh, duopoly. Uh, where all power is situated and uh, um, uh, decision making is uh, is run through the sort of the filtered lens of uh, the environments down there, uh, and then within Queensland you have a big portion of the state uh, geographically look at the southeast corner and think exactly the same thing. So they look at Brisbane, and they say, well, that's uh, 
you know, all our taxes, all our, all, our, all the decision making, all the good things that happen in their state happen in Brisbane, and then they look to Canberra, Sydney, and Melbourne, and then they're doubling down their anger, and they say, they say, um, they they see that sort of, you know, that that's that's where power uh, resides, and everything's seen through that filtered lens, and they don't understand what goes on out in the land and uh, and the issues. So in that environment, you've got to understand, in that environment then you get reactions. You get a reactionary sort of uh, voting flop. Um, I think, uh, you know, CATA, for example, the CATA party up here, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're socialists by any other name. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're a poke in the eye to Brisbane and they're a poke in the eye to Canberra. Um, and One Nation's the same, uh, in my view. Um, I think the new... One Nation Mark Two, that was a much, much uh, more uh, powerful organisation than certainly Mark One. I think uh, Pauline Hanson's, uh, um, she's got some good people around her, um, and I think she's learned a lot. You know, she's probably reflected for a number of years that if she ever got back in, what she'd do differently. So I am a little, uh, um, a little bit circumspect about writing them off. Um, uh, even though the temptation is there because some of their policies are, uh, are uh, concerning in my view. But actually it, they've got a free market bent. They've got a sort of a small government bent to them, which actually I also find strangely compelling. So, uh, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out up here. But I hope that sort of um, explains you to a degree, ex answered your question. Um, there's really there's a big portion of the state here that feels unloved. Yeah, uh, that's. Uh, I remember that there's there, there's a push by well some Queensland politicians to divide the the state in two, have North Queensland and South Queensland. So from what you've described, I can understand sort of where ideas like that come from. Yeah, 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 and you know, devolving power that's always a good thing in my mind. <laughs> yeah, uh, so you don't mind those discussions? <laughs> no, I don't mind those discussions. I wouldn't be trying to hang on to. Uh, hang on to portions of uh, land just because I, I think it makes Brisbane more powerful. I reckon devolve it. <laughs> but anyway, it'll never happen, but, you know, it's an interesting sort of theoretical discussion. Uh, indulgence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I was, if I was, uh, if I was in uh, Western Australia, I'm pretty sure I'd be uh, looking to succeed. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. so let's look at uh, one of Libby Works's key areas of concern, which is uh, free speech. Uh, now, Libby yes. Works provided uh, coverage of the, the Queen, uh, Universe, uh, University of Queensland Technology 18C case uh, last month, and there yep. was actually well, some good news uh, on that in the last 24 hours with the awarding of, of costs uh, to the defendant. So can you describe the role that Libby Works played and what was the experience like throughout the, the whole process? Uh, well, I think first of all, I'll say this: this this isn't over. Those QUT kids, it's not. It's over for most of them, but one of them, Callum Thwaites, um, he's got a whole new journey to go through um, because there's an appeal that's lodged um, in that matter, um, uh, and uh, he's uh, he's also suing uh, Di Butler, the uh, uh, the federal Queensland MP. Terry that took Butler. Over uh, Terry Butler. Sorry. Uh, uh, who took over Kevin Rudd's uh, seat? So there's a bit of, you know, that that that, that that's just almost a side issue. But um, uh, there's a fair bit. I think there's a fair bit to play out. And I, I, my impression is that I'd say that um, Cindy Pryor won't be able to pay the uh, the costs awarded against her. So she, uh, uh, and we're only surmising here, but I suspect that she'll be uh, she'll go bankrupt. Um, I think the role of the HRC in that whole thing, and and if she does go bankrupt, you know what they their role in encouraging her and others to go down this path. I mean, I think we need to really um, we need to really look at how some of these organisations are set up um, and who they who they're uh, uh, who they're run by because um, I mean it's a tragic situation. I mean, you know, she she by all accounts. Has feelings that she gets bullied, that uh, she probably has genuine feelings that the world is against her, that that uh, that people are racist towards her. Um, but you know, we need to be able to deal with those feelings. Um, we can't go, we can't all be go running off to some police 
policemen every time we have a bad feeling. Uh, we need to become adults and learn how to deal with feelings and, and, and move on. And I'm ho very, very concerned that organisations like the Human Rights Commission are there uh, propagating this, uh, this, this thinking that somehow, somehow you can be compensated for having a hurt feeling. Um, and I just think we need to knock that on the head. I am concerned that, uh, that uh, the best we can hope for is amendment to 18C. Um, we lodged a submission yesterday calling for the full repeal. Um, some people say that, well, you know, we should just make some minor amendments and, uh, uh, and, and pull some words out and leave words like intimidation in there, that we can't be uh, intimidated on the base of, of, of race, for example. But the trouble with intimidation is intimidation is just a feeling as well. Um, some people can feel identical circumstances. You can have identical circumstances and two people will feel entirely different things. One might feel int intimidated by a certain circumstance and another won't. So we think the whole thing needs to be repealed. You know, if there's, um, there's uh, harassment or, uh, or uh, um, uh, violence, uh, then they can be, they, they're, they're, they're adequately covered by uh, other aspects of the criminal code. Um, uh, I suspect with uh, sorry, Tim. I'll just get, just finish off the if Cindy Pryor does if she's made bankrupt, uh, I suspect that the lawyers up here in Queensland will be they will end up in a uh, uh, a bit of a legal tit for tat where those fees that should have been paid by Cindy Pryor will be sought by her lawyers. Uh, so. So the lawyers, the the lawyers of the defendants will seek to recover costs from the lawyers of the complainant, um, and that could go on for years. Uh, in fact, I in fact I know that that's the intention. Uh, you mentioned that there's still uh, an appeal uh, concerning one of the students. Are you able to uh, just elaborate on on what what that's in regard to? Uh, so um, there were three students uh, uh, that had their had the case dismissed uh, last month. Um, one of those students, Callum Thwaites, um, has had appeal lodged against his dismissal on the basis that uh, the case against him was dismissed on the basis that there was no evidence that it was him that used the word nigger in a um, in a, a Facebook post. Uh, he's denied it, um, and on the basis that the complainants put no evidence forward to say that it was him, uh, beyond the fact that you know there was a Facebook account with his name on it, uh, it was dismissed. Now the um, uh, uh, the the legal team, the Sydney Prize legal team, have lodged an appeal or attempting to lodge an appeal on that matter. Um, now the crazy nature of how this all works is that their appeal has been lodged late, so now they're sitting. Yes, oh, so that the, was the appeal. Yeah. yeah, so so they've uh, they've sought leave to lodge a late appeal, um, and I, I I'm not 100 percent sure where that's at yet, but I don't believe there's been a decision brought down on that just yet. Okay. Um, so that if that appeal is um, if the lodgement of that appeal is successful. Uh, then Callum Thwaites will be in a whole new uh, um, uh, legal argument, uh, probably centred around evidence about who actually put that uh, those terms there. And then, of course, if they establish that someone, whoever did put that term, if they can find whoever that person is, uh, then there'll be a whole new um, a whole new uh, case by Cindy Pryor. Uh, who already owes two hundred thousand dollars in legal fees? And a whole new, potentially a whole new case against whoever, whoever did put that term, um, or whoever posted that term. So it's got—I think it's got a long way to run. To be perfectly honest. Wow. Uh, and we sort of thought, well, with the news of the last twenty-four hours, that this circus was beginning to come to an end, but it could, could still go on. It's it's interesting, Tim. Uh, Justice Jarrett, who's presiding over the over most of these matters. Has made um, has made uh, comments in court about the hostility between the respective legal teams, uh, and I can tell you from personal knowledge there is indeed a lot of hostility between those teams. Um, so I think I think we're uh, it's potentially moving beyond uh, uh, 
uh, the realm of just pure legal argument. I think there's <laughs> it's a fair bit going on. <laughs> and uh, of with the uh, well, the the dismissal of the of the case, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, defenders of eighteen two saying, "Oh, you know, see, they you know were exonerated in the end." But obviously, there's the you know human rights uh, uh, conciliation process, which or, or basically plays the role of uh, an extortionist. I mean, there were the the other students involved who ended up paying uh, go uh, go away money. So certainly. Uh, 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 th uh, that process can still result in a lot of uh, a, a lot of ha hardship for the people caught up in it. Yeah, and I think we need to separate the issues. There's the issue of whether whether um, uh, hurt feelings uh, is a uh, is something that should be um, worthy of compensation, uh, worthy of a process. And then there's the issue of the process itself. And to me, there's, they're quite separate issues. Um, you know, our submission to the um, uh, freedom of speech inquiry was that was that hurt feelings is not something that is worthy of a legal process. Um, that free speech should just be that free speech, and occasionally free speech will hurt people. But part of our submission was also that um, that the uh, the process itself um, is the punishment, and the process itself is used. It's it's used to basically operate a, a legal shakedown service. Um, you know, complaints are made against complainants. They're dragged into the into a legal process that's expensive. And I know Callum Thwaites, for example, he, he, he started the legal process uh, by representing himself um, in district court. So he's, you know, because he didn't have the money to pay the $5,000, right? He's just a student. Mm -hmm. um, so he had no money. Um, so even if he wanted to, you know, pay five grand and get the hell out of Dodge, <laughs> he couldn't do it. So he ended up uh, representing himself, and that's when uh, Tony Morris QC up here in Queensland uh, uh, contacted him and offered to offer, you know, offer his uh, services pro bono. Um, and if it wasn't for Tony Morris, this would just be another case. These QUT kids would just be none. And Tony Morris and, and and a couple of other lawyers. But if it wasn't for them, this would just be another case that's, uh, you know hidden within the secret walls of uh, the HRC and we'd hardly know anything about it and it'd just be another example of, uh, of a complaint being made, uh, people being dragged into the web, uh, paying out some money and uh, hoping it all goes away. Um, so, you know, I think, I think to me if there are any heroes in this, it's these lawyers that are operating, you know, pro bono. Yes, I was certainly very impressed by uh, Tony Morris, uh, not just his uh, press conference after the decision, but his, his subsequent uh, media appearances as well. He's certainly done a, done a good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, uh, I, I don't know how much he saw, but uh, I've, never, I've never seen a, uh, a lawyer or a barrister uh, give such a spray to, another, to a public official. Um, and I, if I recall correctly, I think some of the things he said was that if Gillian, Gillian Triggs had any decency, she, 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 she should resign immediately. And then he started pointing at the camera and, and saying, but she won't. She hasn't got the decency to do it. <laughs> She'll, con she'll continue to take her $400,000 and laugh at the public. <laughs> and, so, it was and, a fearful spray. I've never uh, seen anything like it. <laughs> and she'll continue to get uh, awards from her friends as well. Correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. obviously, uh, 18C is is sort of the big free speech issue at the moment. But uh, another issue that uh, Liberty Works uh, did an article, and I, I also wrote an article on it a while back, is Section 474 of the the Federal Criminal Code, which uh, makes it yeah. Ill illegal to offend somebody on the internet. So, uh, yeah, would you like I think to talk about that? Uh... Yeah, look, we, we have some concerns. The, the, the words, we have some concerns about the criminal code and, um, you know, that particular uh, uh, section of the criminal code uh, refers to uh, uh, using a carriage yes. service, uh, which is uh, being, you know, uh, redefined to include uh, social media networks. Um, and uh, um, you can't cause offence using social media service, uh, networks. And then this is the thing is that, there is a criminal code there that uses the same terms, but it's administered by quite different people. They're not the HRC is uh, is managed by uh, you know social justice warriors that use our taxpayers to go out and make change to society, whereas the criminal code is 
is administered by, um, uh, you know, by, uh, I guess, uh, you know, the police. Um, so you know, there's a slightly different motivating factors there in terms of how it's used, but we should still be concerned by the fact that the actual terms that, uh, that uh, uh, the terms we're concerned about at 18C are also used in other um, legislation and uh, 417. Point one seven. Oh, sorry, four seven four point one seven of the of the um, criminal code is another example of that. Um, David Leinhelm's got um, an omnibus bill, um, uh, which I think is still current, where he's seeking to remove those terms um, uh, from about eight pieces of legislation. Yeah, which eighteen, yeah, which eighteen C and four seven four or uh, up to or two of those. Yeah, so yeah, we're obviously lucky that it's you know not not enforced as terribly as it could be, but yeah, it's definitely still concerning that it's there. Yeah, yeah, and and the concern is that is that there's no rules about how you and I or anyone for that matter uh, needs to behave in order to avoid getting captured by these these rules because. The maker of the, the the maker of the boundaries is the person receiving messages. They determine whether they're offended. Um, they determine, you know, whether they feel intimidated or harassed. So, um, you know, to me, that's the concern: is where the 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 boundaries or the or the behaviours that are satisfactory or the behaviours that are uh, deemed um, uh, uh, legal or lawful are not behaviours that we knowingly control. Uh, they've been handed over to other people and uh, we only find out with the benefit of hindsight whether our behaviour was in fact uh, uh, lawful or unlawful. So we might finish off now with uh, uh, talking about just current uh, political uh, developments. So uh, obviously uh, we've talked about libertarians are obviously the uh, bigger supporters of Liberty Works, but obviously they spend uh, a lot of time fighting, fighting amongst fighting amongst themselves, even though they still are a very small, a small in number, and it is is quite uh, quite difficult to have uh, su uh, success uh, f uh, when you have when you have those sort of things. So, can this be overcome? Do you think? Do you think we can, or or, or unite? Uh, I'm not confident that uh, uh, libertarianism, as such, under that brand, is something that. Uh, will necessarily catch on in Australia uh, to a to a degree where real political change can happen, uh, uh, and, and and that and most libertarians I don't think would think like that. I think most think that that the logic of their position is so persuasive and so powerful that we only all need to hear it, and then we all become converts, and eventually uh, Australia will become a libertarian utopia. <clears throat> uh, but I, I just don't I just don't believe that, and. Um, uh, I point to the U.S., where uh, you know libertarianism or you know the concept of, of freedom is uh, ingrained in their culture, uh, and yet you know the Libertarian Party over there, for example, you know really struggles to get five percent of the vote. If they're ever going to uh, pick up a big chunk of votes, it was this time. Admittedly, they probably had a poor candidate, but uh, so if you know if America's struggling to that degree, I think realistically. Um, a pure libertarian kind of political movement in Australia is a difficult. It's difficult for me to see that happening. But what we can do is we can influence. We can we can influence uh, uh, those around us to become more libertarian. So to shrink government uh, from where it is now, uh, without without yelling at them and telling them that they must be become. You know, we we have this tendency to say, well, you can't believe. In libertarianism, if you believe in and just insert something, <laughs> hmm. right? Whereas what we need, what I believe we need to be doing, is saying, look, this is the overall philosophy. I understand you have concerns about, uh, say, gun control, but that doesn't mean that we can't agree on on on, uh, say, uh, welfare reform or education or pairing it back. Uh, so we need to find areas that we can agree on and move together. Uh, as as much as we can, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying to convert people to the philosophy 100%. But I just think realistically, over the next you know couple of decades, you know we're looking at uh, at influencing rather than uh, than full conversion. 
Yeah, so I certainly agree that yeah, working with or, uh, people who uh, are not libertarians but uh, share share some of the values uh, is certainly, or considering we are small in lump, in number, a, a, a good strategy if we want to certainly achieve at least some of uh, of what we want. Yeah, yeah, and I, look, I take the the example is that we you know we we do work uh, with members of the Liberal Party. Um, there, there is a classical liberal rump within the Liberal Party that we think uh, need to be energised a little bit more, that don't really have a voice within the party. So there are ways that I think that we can help them uh, achieve what they want within, the, say, the Liberal Party. There is, uh, you know, One Nation to me is a, uh, is a reaction, it's an anti-government reaction. Uh, to me, that's a healthy thing. Um, now, the party itself, you know, you know their policy suite, by any, by any stretch of the imagination, wouldn't be described as libertarian. But I think the, um, I think the, uh, the fact that there's a reaction going on within the population against government, to me, that's a healthy thing. And we shouldn't be out there yelling at people, you know, telling them they don't vote One Nation. What we should be saying is we understand why you voted One Nation, but have you thought about this? Um, and trying to, uh, you know, bring them under the broad umbrella as best we can. Yeah, that's definitely uh, a good approach. I, I completely agree. Um, it's fair to say that 2016 has probably been the year of success for the so-called uh, alt-right, which many of our uh, listeners of this podcast have um, some sympathy for. So what's yep. your opinion of the, uh, of the movement's uh, grievances uh, with current politics and, and what does their rise uh, mean for the ideas of liberty in, in your view? Uh, look, I'll be frank with you, Tim. I don't really understand what alt-right means, uh, but you know, I know, you know, I listen a bit of Milo, and I, you know, and I, I think it's one part entertainment for depending on the personalities we're talking about. It's one part entertainment, and I love it. And the thing about about you know personalities like Milo, he can cut through. Okay, then that's half the battle. Mm. And you can't. There's no point in having a fantastic message that no one listens to. So, uh, uh, to me, any uh, any. Any, if alt if alt right is uh, about say breaking down the uh, uh, or, or, or or halting the path that uh, say America is on uh, in terms of uh, creating a uh, you know a massive government uh, monolith that the rest of us have got to put up with then I you know I think all for it but you know in terms of uh, you know the specific sort of uh, grievances and their solutions and whatnot. I, I, you know, to be honest, I don't even sure, you know, what the overall message is. You know, I just in, in enjoy certain personalities and uh, and uh, I'm all for it. Uh, I've said I've said this before because it is largely sort of on an internet movement that it's if it's made up of a large variety of people with with, with different views. But yeah, they, they, they've certainly or the way they've they've come to prom uh, prominence is is certainly an interesting uh, political development. Um, yes. Well, uh, so yes. Th uh, thank you today, uh, Andrew, for being a guest on our program. Yeah, my pleasure, Tim. Thanks for inviting me on. And I'd advise everybody to visit the Liberty Works website, which is libertyworks.org.au. That's right. Yep. Yep. Thank you. And, and become a member. And also, if you live in Brisbane, come along to, to their regular events. So we are certainly looking forward to hearing more from Liberty Works in the future, and we wish, wish the organisation all the best. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, listeners. All right, that's the show for today. Uh, I'll be back uh, next next week for another review show. Uh, a quick announcement before uh, I wrap up is that I've mentioned that we have the two events next week hosted by the Australian Right Wing Safe Space Facebook group. Uh, they can now be viewed on the Unshackled website at theunshackled.net slash events. So that'll have all the details there for you and that's where we'll post future future events as well. So that's the show and we'll, we'll see you next week and don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio or YouTube. And thank you once again for listening and we'll see you next time.